your patience and being with me tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about what do you do if you have to give online presentations. If you're newer to doing these Zoom calls in the lower right hand corner, if you haven't heard me before, you can uh, type in the chat box. When you do that, you'll see down at the lower right, there is an option, a little blue box that says panelists or everyone in meeting. Uh, go ahead and type to everyone in meeting unless it's something that you specifically want only for my eyes. Uh, usually the questions that people ask, others are asking it, uh, comments, etc. So uh, I like to have kind of the, the communal feel here, get everybody involved, unless it's something specific that you just want me to see. Uh, with that in mind, as we go along, type in your questions. You can use the question and answer box. I find it's easier usually to see, uh, for some reason, the uh, comments come up easier in the chat box. So uh, preferable if you go to the chat box. Uh, let's see. Can we, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Deb said she's doing curbside vet service. They're coming to the car, taking Kitty in, then bringing her back. Okay, that's great. Maybe they should just do that all the time. So, all right, let's talk about how we can help you become a better online presenter. Uh, I, I just thought of this title the other day because a lot of people are nervous and they're probably, they are thinking, help, what do I do? I got to give this presentation that scares me to death. Let me share this with you. If you are used to presenting on stage in front of people, you can do just fine with presenting online. But there are some key differences and I'm gonna take you through those. Uh, an overview of this presentation, I'll make some introductory remarks. We're gonna talk about your physical environment and why that's important. I'll give you some tips on how to organize your material, how to best use visuals, the importance of being more concise even on a, uh, an internet presentation than in a regular speech, some delivery tips, some insights in how to use humor, the importance of questions and answers, and how to improve faster. Now, this will take about 30, maybe a little bit longer because I actually attended another webinar today by another presenter and he had a couple of good ideas that I incorporated in. I'm gonna try to keep this to 30 minutes, plus Q&A, because uh, I want to respect your time, but I also want to make sure you get these ideas so you can start incorporating them. Real quick, I, I know most people on the call, but if you're not familiar with me, the reason I have some credibility in talking about this is because I'm a presentation and storytelling coach. Now that alone doesn't qualify me. It's my work with my own company, Speaking CPR, my work with TEDx Cincinnati and Stage Time University, which is a group of online coaches, uh, I mean, world-class coaches, in the webinars that I've done for all these entities. I've done approximately 450 of these over the last four to five years. The most important part of that number is that it has enabled me to make every possible mistake there is when it comes to online presenting. And I will tell you, it is a different animal. There is a lot of anxiety the first few times you do those. And I'm going to encourage you to just embrace the anxiety because there's no way around it. It's like the first time you drove a car, uh, you, you walked into a university by yourself for the first time with uh, no parental background, uh, guide, just you, you're in a new world, or giving a speech for the first time. It's all very similar, but I promise you, you'll get through it. Let's see, just want to, I'm, I'm going to try, and the thing about these two that you'll learn is you want to make sure you, you can keep an eye on the chat box as much as possible. So uh, again, I'll try to watch that and get through the material on a, on a timely basis, but learn from my mistakes. I'm trying to take my four to five years of learning and shorten yours to maybe about six months to a year because some mistakes I can't make for you, you got to do it yourself. I also see this, this op, uh, situation with coronavirus and everything it's doing to the business world uh, in particular as an opportunity. The people who get ahead of the curve and don't succumb to the fear of this thing, I, I think are going to be seen as confident, in control, and visionary. And to me, that's the definition of a leader. We are gonna need so many leaders coming out of this to get us back on track, to get our economy going again, to is to reestablish trust and try to get back to a normal life. The people that can present with, with, with confidence and do that concisely and who appear to be in control, they're going to be the ones we look up to. And I know you can do that. Your opportunity is to become even more clear about your message. 
as a coach, I'm constantly pre preaching clarity, clarity, clarity. What is the bottom line? What you're trying to get across? That's even more important on an online presentation. Uh, you also want to be more concise. The challenge that you have with regard to online presenting versus being in front of a group of people is keeping them engaged. That's the biggest challenge. Because in, when you're standing in front of an audience, if nothing else for social decorum and not to be rude, 99.5% of people are not going to talk. They're not going to get up and move around. They're not going to maybe flip on the TV and see what's on the screen. All those distractions and many more are what you're battling when you're doing an online presentation. So the key to keeping them engaged, well, give, give me some examples of things that you think people could be doing while you're giving a presentation, whether they're sitting in their home office or their living room, just give me some, some thoughts. Cell phone, thank you, Karen. That's probably number one, watching TV. Checking Facebook, which is more of an insult because they're on the computer and they're not looking at you. Not you, though. Thanks, David. I appreciate that. Email. Yep. Uh, those are some good examples. Playing a game. How about dogs in the background? If you know me, you know I love my dogs, but they can be a distraction. You may have kids in the house, family. Thank you, everybody, for putting those in. Those are terrific examples of what we're battling against. Here's the thing about mistakes. You are going to make them. I promise you they're going to happen. It's because you're doing something new. You're stepping out of your comfort zone. As I said before, embrace them. Don't let those throw you. Here are some examples of some mistakes that you're going to uh, go through. Uh, you may forget to look at the camera. You're going to have issues with what I call time lags. On this technology, there are periods where you'll say something, you'll ask, and nobody's typing in the chat box. Or maybe there's a time lag. Uh, I, there's a, a feature on Zoom where I can bring you on as a co-host if we have a conversation. That takes several seconds. So there are all kinds of issues that can come up, and you're sitting there waiting. I found, especially with the environment we're in, people are very forgiving, and they will be patient. Again, as long as you have some valuable information to share with them. What's gonna happen in your mind though, is you're going to start thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gonna lose my audience. They are gonna start watching TV. They're gonna check Facebook and email if I don't get this thing going. Now, you don't want 60 to 90 second long silences. You gotta fill that time in, but a few seconds will be okay. You can explain to somebody, to, to your audience, look, I'm having a little bit of a techno issue, technical issue. Bear with me. We'll get through this. Just keep them informed. Silence. If you know me as a speech coach, I have been preaching this for well over a decade. Your biggest benefit or kind of your, your biggest asset when you're giving a live presentation is silence because that's where you give people a chance to think about the implication of the points you're making. You give them time to answer questions. You still need to practice that with your online presentations. You, you want to give, you make a point, just sit there for a few seconds. It's okay. Let them think about it. Ask questions. This is one way to keep people involved is to ask questions. We just did it on the last slide when I said, give me some examples. And that's what you did keeping you engaged but you got to have that silence in there too don't just ram through all of your information visuals are going to give you a headache from time to time it's something that you thought would come up won't come up or maybe you want to slide uh, change from one screen to another to give an example you just got to go through it the q a in the chat box is also a distraction it's important but when you're First using this technology and you want to focus on you know, the information that's on the screen and then you see ideas or questions popping up in the chat box or worse people are having technical issues and you don't know how to solve them that can start to frazzle you I, I can tell you the first six months that I was doing webinars especially for my friend Darren and his stage time university I was a wreck after every one because I thought I'd done awful I thought you know, this wasn't my 
brand that I was wearing. It was his. I didn't want to ruin his company. And he was so understanding and forgiving. And it wasn't as bad as I made it out to be. But you will be stressed. Just know that it's part of the process, just like the first two times you spoke. And here's the other thing I'm seeing with people who are newer to this. They over-apologize. Every time something goes wrong, oh, I'm sorry. I Don't do that. If you're newer to this, mention it up front. Say, look, I, I haven't done too many of these. I'm going to make mistakes, but when we do, we'll just push through them. That's all you need. You start over-apologizing, and you don't sound like a leader. You certainly don't sound confident, and that's not what people want. Embrace them, move on, and people will be forgiving, and you'll learn next time not to do the same things. Here's the key to the whole idea of mistakes. Viewers will forgive mistakes, and they will definitely stay engaged if you give them something of value and you remain calm, especially if they think you can help solve some of their problems. And we are definitely in a time where people are having more problems than we at least they perceive they're having more problems than they maybe ever have in their lives. And if you're a presenter, if you're a salesperson, if you're a leader, you've got those solutions. They want what you've got to say. And that's what this all boils down to. Keeping them engaged is letting them know you've got solutions to the problems that are really stressing them out and creating a lot of anxiety right now. So let's start with uh, talking about when you're presenting, how should you set up your physical environment? This is a big challenge on both ends of the presentation. It starts with the camera. If you'll notice, for the most part, I have been looking at you during this presentation. This is really a challenge in the beginning because where do our, our eyes are normally drawn? To the screen, right? I'm looking at the screen right now. And in some of these presentations, you're going to have a group of people in front of you. Well, human nature is when we talk to people we want to look at them so you're giving a presentation but you're looking at marcia here and david there and karen there and you're losing the eye contact once you get this part down everything else seems to get easier but it's it takes a long time and on my computer it's a green light i'm constantly looking at the green light to make sure that i'm making eye contact with you once you get used to this your peripheral vision will become more attuned. And the way you can help that, number one, is put a picture behind the camera. Like I'm gonna, if I could shoot right, this is eye level with the camera and right above is the top of my camera. When I first started doing this, somebody gave me the suggestion, put a picture of somebody behind that, somebody that, who you like, preferably, because you don't want to get mad or frown on these, but, but so picture somebody up there that you like and, and just pretend you're talking to that person or put several pi pictures up. If I'm looking right above the camera line, which I'm doing right now, you probably can't tell. But if I put the picture over here or over here, you're going to know it. So that'll get you used to looking at the camera. The second thing you don't want to do is don't just stare. Maybe blinking every you know, 60 seconds. That's creepy. right? You don't have to do that. Occasionally, you'll see me look around, which is what I do when I talk to somebody anyway. It's off-putting for somebody to stare at you. So I may look down at the, the screen for a second, but then I'll look back just like I would in normal conversation. Try to treat this as much as possible as if you're sitting down with somebody over lunch and you're talking. It just so happens that the person you're talking to is a green, a green dot. The second part of the physical environment is to avoid the distractions to you. And here's what I mean by that. Take a look at this picture. How many distractions are there in this scene? At least 15 to 20. Now, when you're first doing these webinars, you're going to be pretty anxious about just making sure that you look at the camera and get through the material. Once you get comfortable, though, all of these distractions become a bigger problem. I didn't understand this at first, and I would have a glass of water on my desk. And, and after I got used to the, the webinar format, I started thinking, wow, that glass is getting empty. I should get some more water. Or I wonder if the coffee's cold. Or, oh my gosh, my pencil holder got knocked over. 
those things are not important when I'm trying to give a webinar. So the suggestion is, yeah, you, know, you might want to have a glass of water nearby, but put it on a side table over here so it's out of the uh, line of sight. Get this and the pen and the iPad and all these papers, get them out of your, your, your field of vision. They'll be there when the call's over. Focus, this will enable you to focus specifically on the people who are listening to your webinar and the information that's on that particular screen. So there are also distractions to your viewer. Now, I'm not embarrassed by these pictures anymore, but it, it, there was a time when I was, when I was doing, first doing videos for my YouTube channel. This is what I mean by distractions. Those of you that have known me a while know that for a while there, I was kind of testing a brand as far as being the speaking MD because those are my initials. Thus, I put on a white lab coat and a stethoscope, and I had this beautiful white sheet behind me. Not only does it look cheap, but there's a crease back here, and the coat blends into the background, and this is a really not a good, not a good background. It's a distraction. You know, if the lighting was just right, this would I would have looked like a floating head. Even worse than that is this one. I had graduated to my office with the brown background with the uh, wood paneling from the 70s. I was a child of the 70s. Not, that's not the worst part of it, though. Look up here. There is a bright sunlight coming through this window. There's a cork board back here with a couple of documents that I'm not sure what those are. And here are a couple of pictures. Bottom line is this is full of distractions to the viewer. They don't even realize it subliminally. They might be asking, hmm, I wonder what's on that. I wonder what that picture is. The glare is kind of bad. I mean, anything like that can send them off mentally in a whole new direction. We got to get rid of that. So fortunately, I have graduated to the more professional looking gray background. <laughs> and it's okay to have the microphone here. It lets people know that I'm using an upper scale microphone. You can't see it in this one today because of some volume issues. But um, the key here too is to make sure you got good lighting. The lighting in this office is not great. I need to work on that once we get through this mess with the, you know, the economy. Uh, I'll, I'll make an investment there, but this is far better than these two over here. So make sure you have a distraction-free background. You want people focused on the material and looking at you. And some people have asked, even if it's a small uh, video of the presenter, should it be on there or should it just be the whole screen? I like the fact that the, the video shows up in the upper right, at least it is on my screen, because you want to have some kind of connection um, to the person who's speaking to you. There's nothing important that's printed up here. And at least you can see there's some animation of what I'm doing that I am. I'm not just a, a, a robot who's just reading a script. So I try to treat this as much uh, a, a, like a conversation as much as I can. Your style of dress. Uh, with one exception, I will say typically dress the way you would in person if you were giving a live presentation. The exception to that is if you are going to wear a form like a suit and, and tie and maybe a formal dress, unless you're going to stand up and, and really do a wide pan with a camera, I think you can dress down a little bit. Maybe you could wear the sports coat and a shirt. I don't think you need the tie. But just play that by ear and talk to the person, the organizer of the event you're speaking for, whether it's at work, uh, your own group that you put together. Uh, the office that I'm in is a little bit cold today, although I, ha I have the heat on. Uh, so I've got this on. I typically wouldn't wear this, but I needed to stay warm and comfortable so I'm not focused on being cold and I can stay focused on the material that you're getting. Uh, but just Talk to the people if you're not sure, but you can you know, dress like you would at work if this is a work presentation. Uh, you know, don't put on the Metallica t-shirt and the flip-flops, although they can't see your feet. I think there's something about, you know, when you're dressed a certain way, you, you'll act differently than if you were dressed a little too casually. Uh, but just keep it work appropriate. The next step is to organize your material. Uh, the, the material you're hearing, you, that you're watching right now and listening to is 
going right down the line. I made my introductory remarks. We talked about the physical environment, organizing our material, which is what we're in now. Uh, but I like to show this slide at the beginning of my presentation, and we call this a roadmap. Think of it as a GPS for your talk. When you have a GPS, you're going from point A to point B, you know there are certain stops along the way. It helps navigate your, your route. Let the audience know where you're going. Because if they don't, they may be interested in your topic, but they also may start to wonder, okay, where are we? How long is this going to take? Uh, how much more material? I'm getting distracted. So just give them a quick overview. Now, for a 30-minute presentation this may seem like a lot but some of these points are only going to be a minute or two i have one overarching goal here in this and that's to give you ideas on how to be a better presenter online that's my one overarching foundational concept these all support that as far as your visuals i'm going to suggest and this is true i think of live presentations only use them when they add to your point I've been anti-PowerPoint for most of my coaching and speaking career. I've loosened up a little bit because we are visual creatures, but still, I see far too many. Um, now, when I say visuals, I'm doing a presentation with a lot of words here. I get that. But in the beginning, I'm, I'm going to suggest that you keep the number of pictures limited, and here's why. you got to get accustomed to this format, and if you're stressing out over looking at the camera and then giving all this information and then do i get the right pictures in there and oh my gosh the i can't get the pictures to come up you're just adding to the anxiety you'll notice that i've put a couple of pictures in here well before i show the pictures uh, my thought is this if you're trying to do too much too fast it's going to be too stressful the ideas I'm, I'm giving you here are to try to help you to maintain that stress level until you get some comfort with doing this and gain confidence. Now, I included this picture because it's relevant to showing you what a distracted desk looks like. I showed you these to show you what a distracting background looks like. So they weren't just thrown in to have pictures. You needed to see some examples. But other than that, uh, if <laughs> those of you that know me, know that I again I love my dogs and I usually gratuitously throw a picture of them in I left it out for your sake tonight this is also a visual I use when I'm doing my storytelling workshops where this is actually the flow of how you create a an impactful story so I will include that that helps me but this is also a roadmap because I'll talk about this part first and then this and the arrows point the way just like a GPS does so this can be useful as long as it follows a structure. Now, how do we be concise? This is a big, a bigger challenge online than it is live. And I say, as a rule of thumb, take whatever you would spend in a live environment and cut it in half. And here's why. When you're giving a presentation to a group, you can look over and you can see how they're reacting. You can hear their laughter if, if, if something's funny. You can even hear those moments of, hmm, when you've made a really good point. You got none of that here. So you, you're gonna need less time anyway. Now, I know I, I said earlier, you gotta build in some silence, but you also don't have the time that you normally would to maybe put breakout sessions into a, a group. Uh, you, you don't have the time to do that Q&A in the middle. I know we've got the chat box, but I can't see your reactions right now. So that's why I start by saying, and I'll remind you now, if you've got a question or comment, put it in the chat box. But if nothing's going on in the chat box, I just got to keep pushing through. So count on maybe half the normal time, but build in time at the end for Q&A, and we'll talk about that later. The 10 to 1 rule of thumb is one that we use in speaking. I use it here too, and that is for every 10 minutes of speaking time, no more than one major point. I mentioned earlier, I've got one foundational concept here, which is how do you present, become a, a more confident online presenter, and I've got nine sub points, but I'm only working with one major point. An example of where I would be violating this rule is if I said, well, we're going to teach you how to present online. 
And we're also going to teach you how to tell better stories while you're presenting online. And oh, by the way, we're getting these, get into some real in-depth delivery tips. No, don't do that. <laughs> Break that up into three different webinars. Stay on that one main topic all the way through. Limit group activities. Now, I would say in the beginning, don't even try group activities. Zoom, which is the, the software that we're using, the technology for this webinar, actually has something called breakout rooms, where you can send people into groups of two or three where they can have side discussions, activities like that. Don't even try that for a year until you've gotten used to using this technology. The, the only thing I think this is important is to get people engaged by asking questions from time to time, which in all candor, I haven't done enough of in this. Uh, I, because of the kind of the time frame of this, I wanted to make sure I just get the information out to you. If you attend this in a couple of weeks when I do it again, I'll have more involvement with folks. Uh, but right now it's just about getting the information out. But don't do that to yourself. I'm not saying don't do the group activities because it's not good for the audience. It's not good for you, the presenter, when you're new to this format. The other thing is, as you're going through your material, think like an audience member. Ask yourself on any words that you put up on a screen or any videos you show or even images, what does that mean? I know this is hard, but pretend for a moment that you're not really familiar with your topic. You're being asked to sit down and listen to this topic. Does the information you're putting up there make sense? Is it over their heads? Is it like speaking a foreign language? As a speech coach, I have to do this all the time. And if you've worked with me, you know, I've challenged you on things. It's like now, will the audience know what that means? And a lot of times you've got to, you've got to rethink, you've got to step back, rethink it and say, how should I present this in a way that's not quite so industry or topic specific? But this will help you to be concise and get to your point quicker. Now, here are some delivery tips for you. <clears throat> be conversational. Hopefully, I've come across as conversational in this. Uh, for those of you that are Toastmasters, you know, there are no um and ah counters here. It's going to happen. I find that it happens more on video because sometimes you'll say something that you're used to getting a laugh and there's nothing coming back at you. Or you'll make a point and you can't see anybody's face to see if that point hit the mark. And that will throw you off. And you're going to have some of those, what we call killer fillers, that you would be corrected on in a live presentation, especially in Toastmasters. Just be conversational. Stand up. Now, you'll notice that I've, I'm moving around here. I actually have a stand-up desk, but I've chosen to kind of half sit on a chair. The more you can stand up, the more animated you are, the more natural your speaking style is. So if you have a stand up desk, it's great. If not, I've got a like a five and a half foot tower that I can use and put my computer on top of. Now, just because you can stand up and that's a better way to do it does not mean you should be walking the floor and going out of the, the line of sight of the camera. That's not a good thing. <laughs> so you, you still have a limited space to be in. And I was talking with my, my buddy, Phil Barth, yesterday. He's preparing for a speech contest. And he asked that question, do you think I should move around? And I said, no, and here's why. Now, you could do it if you pulled the camera way back. But the key with online is we got to have really good contact with the face. And if you're too far back, people may not pick up all your uh, expressions. They may not see the subtleties uh, that they would up close. So stand up if you can, that gives you more energy, but make sure you're not getting too far back from the camera so that your face is, is in, in uh, frame. One of my clients asked me, what do I do with my hands? Because he has some issues with his hands. He, he does never, never knows what to do with them. You've probably seen my hands come up a couple of times in here, but just do what you normally do. Your hands are very rarely going to show up. Uh, be aware that if you have distracting manners like this, mannerisms, that's going to be picked up by the microphone. Uh, also, if you have uh, happy feet or you're, you're, when you sit, you kick your legs, you may be bumping into things. Be aware of that. 
ask questions from time to time and do check-ins. And one of my favorite check-in questions is one that I'm going to ask right now and put in the chat box. Is this helping so far? Is this making sense? Are you getting some good ideas from this? Yes, thank you, Michael Pope. Great. Excellent. I'm glad, I'm glad it's worth your time. So yeah, check in from time to time to make sure that people are still there, first of all, and that they are getting benefit. Now, here are some insights into humor. This came up yesterday in my call with Phil Barth. <clears throat> this is the biggest challenge you have, aside from getting used to using this material, and here's why. When you say something funny, don't you expect laughter, <laughs> right? That's, that's the signal. That's how human beings convey that something is funny. And I've said three or four lines here that I laughed at and typically get a laugh and I'm not hearing it back. And that's a big challenge. So what do you do if you have humor in your talk and you're a funny person? Deliver the line. And then the next thing you do is in your mind, I want you to hear the laughter. Now, if these are lines that you've said before and have gotten laughter, just go ahead, act as if you've just said it. Let the laughter play through your brain just like you're in front of a live audience. I've had a few lines where I said, and I thought it was funny, and I laughed, and I just heard the, uh, I heard all of you laughing in my head. It's not delusional, by the way. It's just trying to be, just trying to be true to the whole aspect of humor. But just trust that it's, it's a funny line and it got a little bit of a laugh and then move on. Uh, as we always like to say in the speaking world, as opposed to the comedy world, if a comic tells a line that doesn't get a laugh, that's a, that's a disaster for a comic. If a speaker says a line that doesn't get a laugh, hey, it was just an interesting point. Move on. <laughs> so hear the laughter, move on. And never explain the humor. I've seen people do this where, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to get comfortable saying something funny when there's no response. <laughs> and then they'll start, well, when I tell that joke in an audience, it gets a lot. No, don't do that. Just move on. Uh, let's see. Do you pause if, as if the audience is laughing? Yeah, I try to, Michael. That's a good question. Um, same with asking questions. Ask the question. Say the funny line. Pause. And what's good about this format, maybe even better than live, is you can say, uh, you know, ask the question, say, give me an answer in the chat box. And when I asked the last question, I got six, seven, eight yeses. That took a few seconds. But as I'm reading them out loud, I'm not losing the, the attention of the audience. Now, if any of you hear something from here on out that's really funny, you can go ahead and put that in the chat box, or you could put groan or whatever. I don't mind. But have fun with that. Now, let's talk Q&A. Q&A is an important part of a live presentation, but I've seen it misused so many times. Uh, when we do live presentations, our, we always coach our clients, never end on questions and answers. We're not saying don't do questions and answers, don't end on it, and here's why. Because people remember the last thing you say. And if you end on a Q&A and somebody asks a really bizarre question that goes way off topic, what do you think people will remember? What do you think they'll be talking about out in the hallway after your talk? The bizarre question. My coach, Craig Valentine, gives, a, this is a better experience than I ever had with Q&A. And I really learned this from him early on, so I've never had any strange situations like this. He was giving a presentation years ago about storytelling. And he, he gave this technique that people love. And, and at the very end of the talk, he said, I'll take questions. And a woman raised her hand and said, yeah, I got a question. This is really fascinating. You think this would work with my horse? What? <laughs> that's what he said. Craig said that's how he reacted in the audience, too. And what do you think people were talking about in the hallway afterwards? That crazy question from that lady with the horse, and they didn't remember the last thing he said. So avoid that kind of situation. Never end on QA. 
Now that's for live presentations. I think Q&A is more important on the online uh, format for this reason, especially with what we're going through right now. There's a lot of anxiety, stress, uncertainty about a lot of these issues and people do have a lot of questions. So I, I will have final thoughts when we end this, but I'm gonna open it up for Q&A. And when you do that, you're giving people a, a, a chance to, to alleviate some of their concerns and their fears. And you're also giving them additional insight. What I also love about Q&A, in putting this together, this presentation I kind of put together on the fly in the last few days, realizing that this is a problem people were facing. I did the first version yesterday. Three questions came out of that Q&A that I added to this presentation tonight. Then when I went and watched another speaker today, I added two more points. So this is a little bit longer than the original version because there's more critical information to add. So this will give you some feedback on what else you can add to your presentations. Allow for extra time. If you tell people it's gonna be a 30 minute talk, tell them, hey, we may have an extra 10 or 15 minutes. And I tried to kind of set you up for that when we started tonight. Here's the other important part. Go off script if necessary. Now, I didn't see that necessary tonight, but what I mean by this is you may have in your mind what's important for your audience to hear. You've put together the presentation, but if you start to get questions that are taking you down a whole different road and you're seeing the same question pop up, get off the prepared presentation and start answering those questions because that's why the people are there and that's how you're going to keep them engaged and interested they're telling you something that hey we need these questions answered we're concerned about this so be ready to go off that script if you have to and the last tip i want to give you um i like the picture in the picture how is that done on zoom chris i'll try to answer that when we get through this last part uh, don't let me get off here without answering that um, how do you improve as fast as possible? And this is one that I know for certain you're not going to want to hear, especially if you've been coached by me, you, you know what I'm about to say. And that is record yourself, right? And then watch it. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to say, yeah, I recorded it. Good, did you watch it? Uh, um, not yet, I haven't. <laughs> And I know the reason why, because the first time my coach, Darren, told me 15, 19 years ago to record myself and watch it, I gave the standard answer. Oh, Darren, I really don't like watching myself. And his response was the best possible one. He said, oh, I'm really sorry. You, you, you don't like watching yourself? That's too bad. <clears throat> Guess what? We had to watch you. It's a great line. I've shared it for 19 years ever since, but underneath it is a real truth. How in the world can you expect anybody else to want to watch you if you're not willing to watch yourself? Now, aside from that little bit of soapbox wisdom, it will also give you great insight into what you're doing well and where you need to improve. And I think it's important when you're watching the video, ask yourself this question, what did I do well? I tell people all this, this all the time when we're coaching live speaking. If you don't ask that question, guess what? Whatever you did well, you're eventually going to stop doing because you're not, you don't know it's working. So ask yourself that first. Then ask yourself, what can I do better? And then write, the, write them down on a list. And here's what's really important about that list. And let's say you've got nine things written down. Do not try to fix those nine things all at once. Just like you wouldn't try to do it for a speech. It's too much too fast. So I, I'm just gonna Im imagine a scenario with, uh, with me here. Let's say that you've been told that you're gonna be doing an online presentation every week for the next 13 weeks. Pick a number, pick a, it might be every day. Go watch the first one or write down those nine things that you did wrong or you could have done better. I don't even like to say right or wrong. Pick number one and say tomorrow or the next time I do it, I'm gonna work on that one. Try that a couple times and then go to number two on the list and then number three. And what you'll see happening is some of the other ones will start to take care of themselves the more you do this. But do not create even more stress for yourself by saying, I gotta fix those nine. 
because that you're just it's going to make it worse just like you would in a normal speak, uh, speaking situation. The other thing is be coachable, be open to feedback. Be willing to share your video with other people and ask them the two questions I just asked you. Say, hey, what do you think was good here? What do you, what do you think I did well? Great, I'll keep doing that. Where do I need to improve? Great, we'll fix that. The, the, the most successful speakers I know, the most successful online presenters are willing to get out there and do it, but then get that feedback as soon as possible and implement it. So that is a lot. Uh, I do want to let you know if you want to improve your storytelling skills, because storytelling is just as important online as it is uh, in front of an audience, that I'm going to be doing a storytelling webinar in about a week and a half. I don't have all the details, but if you want uh, me to send you some follow-up information on that, just send me an email, Mike at Speaking CPR, and just say, hey, let me know the uh, details when you get those. Uh, with that, I'm gonna open up the chat box for any questions that you have that I have not covered, or if you need clarification, Chris, I will see uh, on the Zoom, how do I get the picture in picture? I think that happens automatically when I go to, when you're in pre presentation mode, there is a box down at the bottom that's share. That's when you can share your screen. And I'm pretty sure that when you go to full screen, when you're sharing, that that little box just shows up automatically. Let's do this, Chris. If you have Zoom and you try that and it's not working, uh, just shoot me an email and we we'll, we'll get on for a quick call and try to figure that out. But I do believe that's automatic. Uh, I like your lighting, says David, and background, do you think it's universally useful? Pending an explicit need to do something else. Now, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, David, if, if it's universally useful. If you could just help me understand that a little bit more about what you mean as far as like in all presentations, is it good for all presentations? As far as the lighting and background, yeah, I think so. I was watching a seminar, a webinar earlier today and somebody asked the question, should I have a bunch of text and pictures in the background? Look, you saw the pictures of my earlier videos with all those distractions. I just don't think it's a good look. You want them focused on if you, whatever verbiage if you put on a screen and you because that's going to keep them more engaged just think the le the fewer the distractions the better the image is hopefully that helps um best way to get a good audio lisa i've got a plug-in a uh, microphone i'll bring it down here that's one that just has a usb on the end it is a uh Gosh, Audio Technica. Gosh, I forget the price on those. Um, you, you can get a pretty decent microphone to plug into your computer for probably as little as $50 or $60. Now you, be sure that you test because for a while with this one, I was bringing it down here and you can probably hear that the sound gets louder but also gets distorted. So I found that that's kind of like an optimal distance is maybe 12 inches from my mouth to the microphone. Uh, other recommended, yeah, that's it. I, I use the Audio Technica. I know there's something called the, there's a, it's a round ball. I think it's called Blue Snowball or something like that. I've had one of those before. That's not bad. Uh, but the most important thing is test it. And the way you test it is just do a video like this on your computer and then play it back and just see how it sounds. Uh, it, it takes some trial and error, and there is no one universal method of doing it. It depends on where you, uh, the distance to, to uh, your mouth, the uh, room that you're in, background noise, etc. So, any other questions? Uh, Will I send you the deck? I could, Carl, that's a good question. I'm happy to do that. And I also will send a link to this recording too. All right, before we go, if you have 
uh, I always like to get takeaways. And this is something that I recommend anytime you do a webinar. The challenge we have as speakers and, and presenters, whether it's live or on a webinar, is we're never really sure what sticks with the audience. We think we know it's important and we know it's important to us, but we can't really be sure. So if you don't mind before we go and before I have a final thought is type in the chat box a takeaway for you that you can use in your next presentation. Uh, Michael Pope says, be clear with your message, show people your roadmap. Excellent. Thank you for that, Michael. Here's the reason you want to do this. You want to make sure that your audience is getting good information, but it also tells you what you should focus on next time. You know, I might come in thinking that it's all about the camera. If I'm talking to a group of people that have some experience, so they may know, okay, I get that, Mike, give me something else. So don't ever assume you know what the audience wants to hear, ask them. Chris, great to see you. Let me know about that Zoom issue. We'll get on a phone call if it doesn't work. Uh, record and watch it, says Lisa. Physical environment, says Karen. Picture behind the camera. See, we've got three, four different um, perspectives right there. Ask the audience questions they can provide quick answers to to keep them engaged. Excellent. Yeah, so this is what you do. You ask them questions, and it's, it's like getting that feedback. What did I do well? Okay, well, I know now that people like the roadmap, be clear with the message, record it, physical environment. So I know all those work. So that's a lot I realize in about 45 minutes. Thank you for uh, your attention tonight. Uh, I want to close with this. These are unprecedented times. I'm 56. I lived through 9-11. Uh, I was, you know, 20, in my 20s when President Reagan got shot. I lived through the 70s with inflation and the end of the Vietnam War. Never thought I would see what we're seeing now. And, you know, it may get worse before it gets better. We don't know. But I do know this. We will get through it. We always do. And when on the, on the other side of this, this country and this world is going to need leaders, people who are confident, who can stand in front of them and share solutions to problems. And you and I are those people. If you just take these ideas and start to implement them on these webinars, and then when we get back to live presentation, use those, you are going to have an impact on people, that you are going to be one of the voices they need to hear to feel like, okay, we're gonna be all right. So just keep getting out there, get uncomfortable with this. I promise you it will get better with repetition, just like it did when you first started speaking. Get your message out there. Let the world hear your voice. They need you more than ever. And we'll get through this together. And on the back end, we're going to have some great stories to tell. And then we can do our storytelling workshop. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Uh, real quick. Uh, ask the questions, uh, let's see, like watching yourself and people will like watching you. Thank you, Irene. And yes, Lisa Lee, share this. Once you get this link, share it with anybody. My whole point in this is, is helping people reduce their anxiety. Uh, it's my calling, I feel, to be a, speech, a speaker and a speech coach anyway, but especially now. I want to help as fast as possible as many people. So you get this, feel free to share it. I don't mind at all. If you have any questions, just contact me, Mike, at Speaking CPR. And hopefully sooner than later, I will be seeing you on stage and not just on a webinar. <laughs> Keep your uh, eye on your mailbox. I'll keep you in informed about other webinars that we're going to be doing in the near future. Keep the faith. We will get through it. Talk to you soon.